I'm Georgina. I'm the, currently the senior spectral geologist at the Geological Survey. I'm here to talk to you about a fantastic opportunity to look at the type example of iron oxide copper gold in South Australia, and that's Olympic Dam. So the spectral geology team at the GSSA have been active participants of OzScope's National Virtual Core Library since 2009. Um, as a part of this national collaboration, our scope is to provide spectral characterisation of mineral systems across the state of South Australia. To date, we've provided over 400 kilometres of drill core data, uh, and it's all available on the National Virtual Core Library or the SARIG portal. The main point of this talk is to Israel that all this spectral data is already available to you guys on the internet. And I'd like to inform and inspire you to use spectral geology in your exploration and research programs across the South, South Australia. I'm going to start with some stats on our OD scanning campaign. Then we'll briefly recap what we already know. But how do you take that knowledge to the next step? Uh, moving into a discussion around the complexity of mineralogy, OD, and then in a spectral sense, how complex can that be? And finally, I'll be presenting a few examples of the techniques you can use with your spectral data, and then I'll recap the major points. So we've taken the original 14 kilometre transect of this world-class ISCGU deposit of approximately 27 cores and 30 drill holes and expanded it. Bigger is better, right? <laughs> the original idea was simple. It was to characterise the alteration mineralogy of the Olympic Dam breccia complex and the surrounding region to get a better, better handle on vectors towards ore and for mineral systems across the domain. So we've loaded all the cores onto SARIG with the following characteristics. They have a restricted mineral set, which removes minerals that don't make geological sense. This method also improves the spectral interpretation by removing minerals with overlapping features. We've also included a set of standard scalars or algorithms that look at particular features of a mineral spectrum. And BHP have generously provided all the geochemistry for each of the 108 drill holes. So how can we use spectral geology to inform us about the deposit and then infer this information further afield? in an exploration sense, or perhaps use this information to inform other specs, uh, aspects of the mining process. For example, knowing more about the gang mineralogy could be used to inform the processing of ore. So we spent probably three years scanning drill cores from Olympic Dam. It's now 108 drill holes and 70 kilometres. Um, that's a lot of core trays, but more impressively, that's almost 9 million spectra. But the beauty of this data is that it can be downsampled to the interval of interest. For example, the assays we've been provided were taken every five metres, and the da data has been downsampled to five metres, leaves us only with 1,758,000 spectra. So a great deal of time and effort has been spent to make sure all the data is consistent. And this, as the spectral algorithm, algorithms improve, we'll also update those drill holes on the database so you have the latest information for your exploration campaigns. Keep an eye on our regular updates in MESA Journal. I'm not going to linger on this, but a quick spectral recap. Previous work has indicated fingeritic compositions for sericites at Olympic Dam. And the power of spectral analysis is clearly demonstrated here as the spectral, spectral algorithms are detecting changes in the composition of this mineral with wavelength variations from long to short related to the proximity of the highest grades of ore. Additionally, a change in the composition of chlorite from iron to magnesium rich compositions complements the aforementioned change in sericite. Given the diversity and complexity of Olympic Dam, like so many others, the spectral geology team have been focused on different aspects of the mineralogy. We've only just touched the surface. There's plenty more updates to the data set to come as we progress with our analysis. The essential message from previous work, anyway. the essential message from this work is that all zone sericite, or fengite, 
is associated, associated with the Roxby Downs breccia complex, have more aluminium and hence shorter wavelengths are lengths around 2206 nanometers. While the signature of fengite from the distal less altered Roxby Downs granites have less aluminium and longer wavelengths, around 2213 nanometers. I believe this discrete change in white marker wavelength is one of the key factors when looking for ISEGs hosted in Hiltifer sweet granites across the Olympic domain. So we took the historic research from these two diamond drill cores and expanded it. We looked at the wavelengths between the white marker wavelengths or the sericite wavelengths between 2190 nanometers and 2220. And I've included a couple of depth slices at about 550 metres and three, 350 and 500 metres. Um, we're looking for those green colours, and that's the short wave wavelength fengite associated with the ore zone. So that's 2206. The main image shows the model where each data set has been downsampled to five metres, and the cells of the model are gridded at 100 metre cells. But you can clearly see the distribution of white mica. We then gridded up the 2205 nanometer into shells at the bottom right. It shows the shorter wavelength towards the center of the field. Obviously, the inclusion of deeper holes will need to um, perfect the model a bit more. Just to quickly recall that sericite increases as chlorite decreases. Chlorite has two main features in the short wave infrared one at 2250 nanometers and the other at 2350 nanometers. Both of these features change to longer wavelengths as iron replaces magnesium in the, chlorite, in the structure of the chloride. We then plotted the difference between the short wavelength chlorides at 2248 nanometers and longer wavelength chlorides at 2252 nanometers. And that's that reflecting that chemical, chemical change between magnesium to iron rich. The main diagram displays the change in chlorite wavelengths from shorter to longer wavelengths. We then plotted up these changes as ISO shells, where you can see the lovely distribution of shorter wavelengths surrounded by longer wavelengths. Again, the more we understand about these minerals and their change in relationship to the ore is the information we can use to both inform exploration for ISEs across the Olympic domain and also reveals about something about the nature of the mineralogy that can affect processing. Previous work has indicated there is a regional albertization pattern and the, fields, and the feldspars have been stained by iron oxide. So we started looking at feldspars as a purely spectral per perspective, trying to create spectral scalars that distinguish these at a drill hole level. However, the sampling interval just wasn't possible. On the larger scale, we then plotted up the spectral response for feldspars or plagioclase um, potassic and plagioclase. So on the, on the larger, on the regional sense, um, Blanche one is generally considered to be outside the ore zone. It's located approximately six kilometres away. Um, I would argue the presence of fengitic sericite and chlorite still suggests this is slightly altered. This image was borrowed from the 14 kilometre transect completed in 2014 and shows the distribution of potassic feldspar in relation to the Breccia complex. The spectra of the right display the complexity of the feldspars in the spectral region between orthoclase and microcline. The main model shows the distribution of microcline across, across the 70 kilometres of drill core. And you can see the barren core with no feldspar and the blue colours at the centre. And the distribution of microcline extending outside that into the breccia complex. Previous work suggested that change in microcline to orthoclase, which is generally associated with hotter fluids, could be used to vector towards ore. So I've plotted the distribution of microcline at 550 metres compared to that of orthoclase. Ortho has a distinct pattern I have yet to model in conjunction with the geochemical data. Keep an eye out. I've also plotted up the distribution of microcline versus albite, where albite has been progressively replaced by case bar towards the centre of the deposit.
A great deal of time and effort has been spent to make sure all the data is consistent, including the same restricted geological sensibly minerals. As you can see, there are over 90 minerals we can detect using spectral methods and included in this data set. I'll give a little warning, it is still evolving. I'll also add that we've included some minerals that aren't on this list, because as the sulphides are exposed to the elements, they are evolving into new minerals, which can potentially be traced using spectral mineralogy. Minerals like azurite or malachite, copper carbonates that wouldn't normally be found in this deposit, can now be seen in the core. For example, <laughs> the weathering sulphides has also, um, you can see here we've got the chalcopyrite is oxidizing. You can track this in spectral geology. And one question I have been asking is how well can we use these weather sulphides to track the economic minerals across the deposit? I believe this could be an exciting problem to resolve because many of the cores in the Olympic domain are in a similar situation. Unfortunately, many minerals share overlapping features, particularly carbonates. At Olympic Dam, and the ever-present iron oxide spectral signature is in the, in the thermal infrared, interferes with the automated spectral interpretation for carbonate. Previous work using diagnostic carbonate features at 6,500, 11,000 and 14,000 nanometers can be used to distinguish types of carbonates. But how does this theory perform in an iron oxide setting? The caveat at OD is, of course, the staining of hematite. In the top image, you can see the spectral plot highlighting the three diagnostic features of carbonate in the thermal infrared. Using the strongest diagnostic features of the carbonate and working to less prominent parts of the spectrum, we approach the discernment of carbonate from a purely spectral perspective. Stage one involves using automated software to plot the two diagnostic carbonate features at 11,000 and 14,000 nanometers. In the diagram, a variety of carbonates have been identified, but you can see the pink side, right? While it has plotted in the expected wavelength range, there's quite a significant amount of material not grouping with the rest of it. Additionally, dolomite and calcite and anchorite all have overlapping distribution. Stage two, um, we use the two strongest features that don't overlap with iron oxide and further distinctions can be made. However, there's still a significant amount of unclassified material. Stage three, using the developments from stage two, these spectral features were then compared to the third diagnostic carbonate feature at six and a half thousand nanometers. Siderite, dolomite and calcite are all plotting in the expected wavelength ranges. However, there are a few unusual groupings occurring. In stage four, we roughly classify these groups, including some outliers, but the iron-rich dolomite was separated into different classes based on the 6,500 nanometer feature. The classification was then compared to the original plot of carbonate by overlaying it onto the automated interpretation. The dolomite and calcite occur in the top of the hole in the cover units. Siderite is found in the bottom of the hole. And we're currently unable to assign the pale blue group or the purple horn associated with dolomite. Potentially, these could be influenced by the inclusion of other elements, for example, barium. The orange group, when compared to the assayed results, corresponds to the higher iron values and the presence of hematite right in the middle of the ore zone. So we can now track the hematite stained carbonate. We know that barite occurs in the barren centre of the deposit, so we use a different technique called P-fit or polynomial fitting. It's simply a spectral index used from an attribute that you can model very small features of a particular mineral to map its distribution. In this case, we use the feature around 10,140 nanometres. As you can see, um, barite detected in the middle of the hole quite rapidly. We can now quickly trap, um, we can quickly model the infertile parts of the ICG system, relatively quickly identifying these gang minerals, which 
prior to the processing of ore. So the next step is to get other spectra for things like high alophane, which is barium-rich feldspar, and see how we can trace them using spectral methods. So due to their challenging deconvolution, due to the challenging deconvolution, we're still working on automating the um, algorithms that are used to identify carbonates. And when we're confident, we will update the whole data set and let you guys know. It's well documented that felsic intrusives across the Olympic domain are high in rare earth elements. We can detect a variety of small features in the very near infrared using and using polynomial fitting can plot those against to get a better idea of their distribution. This amazing data set comes with high resolution imagery. Is there enough detail in the imagery that we can log cores consistently across the deposit? And one of my favorites is the felsic matrix index. It's simply a spectral algorithm that tracks peaks between seven and a half and 11 and a half thousand nanometers. And as you can see from the diagram, a little bit more work to separate these mafic lithologies from the more intense iron oxide zones. So this was a fantastic opportunity to characterise one of the world's biggest and the best iron oxide copper gold deposit in our backyard. We've taken the previous knowledge to the next level, bigger is better, <laughs> with potassium feldspars, which change from microcline to orthoclase. You get an increase and a decrease in sericite and chloride, but deconvolving carbonate varieties um, using their three diagnostic features is great. It's the best way to go. <laughs> Other minerals like barite and rare earths can be traced using uh, small spectral features and polynomial fitting. So keep an eye out for these updates in the coming months. I hope I have inspired you to use your spectral data in exploration. And most importantly, the data's already out there. Have at it.